we are of the earth. Uh, recently, I, I had a conversation with Ram Dass, um, and we were talking a little bit about this stuff, and he, he, he did this, just like wiggling his fingers, and he just said, fingers on the hand. And from his perspective, he's talking about, you know, fingers on the hand of, of God and, you know, unconditional love consciousness that mm -hmm. guru Neem Karoli Baba embodied. But for me, my guru is the earth. And I got a lot of clarity, actually, the last time I was with Ram Dass. I was like, even though I was raised in this tradition, um, my guru is this earth, this planet. And she talks to me all the fucking time. <laughs> and every time I stop to listen, she's there and she's communicating to me. And um, all I have to do is follow the guidance of this higher order of consciousness that is literally asking us and giving so many of us instruction. Before I even get into the questions that I had sent you in an email uh, related to this theme of post-doom sort of conversations around overshoot, grief, gratitude, and grounding, uh, help us get you, like help the people who are hearing or listening to you or seeing you for the first time, help us get you, like what, what give us a little bit of, of uh, your background and uh, what you're most passionate about or concerned about or interested in now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's a necessary thing in any setting because uh, my background is pretty unique uh, and requires a little bit of digging into. Um, so I was born and raised um, at an in interspiritual ashram uh, here in America, in, in Florida, uh, called Kashi Ashram, which is a really beautiful environment um, that has over like 16 different temples to different forms of the divine uh, from many different traditions. and. I was raised, um, I was born in the early 90s, so toward the end of the most intense elements of the AIDS crisis. Um, but of course, we're still dealing with, you know, this massive epidemic. Um, and, and certainly in the 90s, it was really intense then as well. And so our community was really devoted to hospicing um, wow. patients who had been completely disregarded and uh, abandoned by, by their families, uh, often because they were queer and often people of color. Of and um, so I was kind of always, uh, I was always in the work that I'm doing now, um, you know, caring for people who are dying, who, you know, I would go over to the hospice house, they'd be complete strangers, and then they would be a huge part of my life, even if only for the last few weeks of their life. Um, that was a hugely informative, you know, uh, experience of my childhood. Um, and we also had this beautiful, luscious environment. You can see some of what it looks like here outside my window. Um, and this biome where we live uh, geographically, where, where I was raised, is right in between the subtropics and the Carolinas um, in Florida, in Central Florida. So uh, we can grow all kinds of different food and plants here that you can't really grow uh, even just a few miles north or south of here. Um, and we also lived like kind of on the edge of town, but then on the other side of town was, uh, is a huge buffer preserve, a huge uh, nature preserve. So um, we were kind of somewhat in the world, but somewhat isolated because we were a subculture, um, but also had just this beautiful, luscious, uh, amazing land and like river that we could kayak in um, all the time and go camping. So. I feel like I was in so many ways raised at, uh, at a threshold point in, in, in every possible way. And also just the fact that I am white and I was raised um, Hindu. And then uh, later on, my mother uh, became a really devoted uh, student and then eventually teacher of Tibetan Buddhism. All of these things really influenced me at a young age. And I also, um, you know, present in a way that carries a lot of privilege and, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm constantly aware of all of these different aspects of whatever karma brought me into the world at this time sure. uh, to serve and support people as much as possible. And uh, to kind of bring up to speed, I, um, I went to school at New College of Florida, which is a, a very, um, very liberal, very uh, psychedelic environment. Um, a lot of psychedelic harm reduction and a lot of psychedelic studies have come from um, that school and that institution. So I had exposure to some of the cutting edge work in that world there. And now I am studying to be an interspiritual minister through a really amazing program that is uh, really rooted in integral theory and spiral dynamics. 
um, and am learning to support and serve people uh, from all spiritual backgrounds and especially people who don't identify spiritually at all to help support them through um, grief and loss and death and uh, the chaos that we're facing in our world right now. Um, so that's kind of the, yeah. the overview of, of me and my motivations and my background. How do you describe, like what language do you find useful in thinking about our times, uh, you know, especially looking at a deteriorating future? I mean, looking at a, a contracting society, culture, uh, ecosystem, um, which is so radically different than the kind of world I was born into in 1958. I mean, my youngest daughter is about your age and the, my children are living in a different world than the world that I lived in and my parents lived in. Um, and so how do you language that? Uh, what, what, what language works for you or do you find most helpful in describing our times and what you see unfolding into the future? Yeah, it's interesting. There, there are two words that I continuously go back to in all of the work that I'm doing that I uh, sincerely hope become ever more and more present memes in human consciousness. And um, one of them is regeneration, which is... absolutely in our vernacular somewhat, but uh, I think we could really expand on it. Um, and regeneration to me means it's an omni-inclusive systemic process that includes death, it includes chaos, it includes destruction. Um, if you look at regenerative agriculture, which is one of the areas of the world where that meme is taking off the most, you know, composting and uh, working with what is, is an absolute necessity. Working with what has died, taking, you know, biomass and turning it into biochar and like using the flames of transformation to really um, nourish the soil and bring carbon back into the soil. Like at every level of regenerative practice, we can see that death and decay and um, working with absolutely everything that we've been given is a really, really essential element of of the solutions at hand and when i look at the world right now um i see a regenerative process that our planet is going through um and our planet has gone through multiple mass extinction events i uh don't think i think it's important not to be hubristic and think that we are um you know unique in our destructive capacity there have been other things that have created massive die-offs on this planet before, but right now we happen to be, if you're listening to this, you happen to be born into a human body, which means that you're a part of the species uh, and of the force that is contributing to this extinction event, and that it's not just uh, happening because it's a matter of course. It's happening because of choices and culture that we have created um, and that we can uncreate, I believe. Um, if we're given a chance, we can choose to be a part of the regenerative process of this planet, or we can just continue believing that uh, we have domination over everything and that everything can be reduced to really, really basic concepts and um, have just this like incredibly destructive, reductive relationship with reality. That's that's what some people are unconsciously choosing. But I see I see what we're going through as, you know, a lot of a lot of cultures, you know, when winter would come around, you know, there are stories of of you know their primary deities like Inanna who would go down into the underworld and would be you know horrifically wounded and would have to go through an entire death process in order to come out with more integration um and you know every month the moon becomes new every year we have a winter and uh every couple of million years, the planet goes through a massive transformation. We have a choice as to how much destruction we're going to be a part of in relation to it. That's, that's the way that I see it. And yeah. it's not really, doom is not really a part of my vernacular um, when I'm able to take a step back and look at things through that lens of deep time. Yeah, I'm not at all surprised. I mean, most people who get the centrality of death and decay in regeneration, uh, doom is sort of like a, well, it, I, I intellectually know what it means, but it, it yeah. doesn't doesn't resonate emotionally. I, I love the quote that you have, uh, or the statement that you have on your website. Uh, Regeneration is the universal principle that more life, meaning, and evolutionary potential can and will always come from death, decay, and entropy. Well, and that speaks to um, without using the word centropy. That's really me yes. talking about the word centropy, which. Exactly. Um, 
is I think, which is the other word that I keep on using in my work, uh, because I think it's one of the most important concepts for our civilization to kind of get hip to uh, at this moment. Yeah, no, I completely agree. In fact, uh, um, uh, David, David McConville, do you know David? Yeah, David is a dear friend of mine. Oh, sweet. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. Lucky Fuller, my God. Well, so you stand on the shoulders of giants and, um, and further their work in some really compelling ways. And so I'm curious if you could share some, now obviously you were only born in, in the 90s, so you don't have a lifetime of expectation of sort of perpetual progress yeah. um, that you've had to overcome. Nonetheless, you have, I'm sure, gone from, because you've been raised in such a nurturing community, spiritual and otherwise ecological, um, you've had your own uh, demons to wrestle with, or at least things to grapple with. And so I'm curious, this is, I wanted to really create in this conversation series a space for people to share their story, to not just share their teaching points, because I mean, there's some amazing teachers that are part of this conversation series, um, but really to also share, and primarily to share their, their pilgrimage, their story, their narrative of, of how they came to an understanding of, oh, things aren't getting better and better and easier and easier and wealthier and wealthier. And it's not just, you know, to the stars, um, which isn't to say that there won't be profound transformations along the way. But nonetheless, we're also looking at a contracting culture, contracting times, declining deterioration of the health of the ecosystems and so forth. And so anything that you'd love to share around your story of, of how you came to that, and especially if there were any episodes of grief or sadness or anger along the way, um, Anything that you would that you could share of your own journey that someone perhaps knew into this who's only getting beyond the oh shit kind of stage uh, that would be a, a, a spiritual nourishment for them based on your life experience so take as much time as you want thank you um, it's kind of a tricky question for me to ask uh, to, for me to answer knowing that there's um, you know an audience listening because uh, because my life is so different than so many other people's lives, um, I don't know how relatable what I'll be sharing is, but I'm mm-hmm. happy to share it anyway. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, I was raised in this community that was interspiritual, very uh, explicitly inclusive, and also... So say, say, say more, yeah. just because uh, I want to make sure everybody that's listening or watching to this, or watching this can, can come on board. What do you mean by interspiritual? Yes. So uh, interspirituality is a way of relating to the divinity and all things in a way that is, uh, has no gatekeeping, essentially, that doesn't say my way of relating to God or spirit or the divine or the sacred, whatever language reality, you want, uh, reality is, um, is, is better or more valid than yours. Um, the community that I was raised in, uh, like I said, said earlier, you know, has temples to um, so many different traditions and gardens to many more, um, to many, uh, you know, expressions of the formless uh, in the world. And, um, and yeah, we, our entire ethos is that kindness is, is our religion, primarily, uh, shortly followed by Hinduism, (laughs) Uh, and then, you know, everything in kind of concentric circles. Um, But Hinduism is really central to what we're doing, which is beautiful because Hinduism, um, certainly not, certainly not the nationalistic Hinduism that is causing so much pain in the world right now, but Hinduism at its core, as I was taught, is a deeply pluralistic uh, way of relating to the world. And it also has immense deep time. Uh, Hinduism, I think more than any other religion, has a conception of time that goes way further. And um, it's just an amazing system. Uh, But it's pluralistic, meaning that it includes everything. And um, it has the capacity to include and hold everything. There is no rigidity. Um, And so that's, that's a, that was a really foundational element of my upbringing. Um, Also in terms of uh, culture and identity, my father was born and raised in um, post-war Germany. And he had a lot of trauma uh, from being raised in that culture, uh, like masculinity trauma of just, you know, Germany has a really weird relationship with the mask, with lots of things. Um, And and also of course, the the guilt and the shame of of being, uh, you know, 
in the legacy of the Holocaust. So I was raised with a really tremendous degree of sense of personal responsibility to um, genocide and uh, any any form of of abuse and domination um, and uh, and judgment and dehumanizing others. Uh, I was raised um, kind of with an overdrive of, of early childhood education around the horrible things that humans are capable of and a deep sense of responsibility to be a force for the opposite of that. So um, that was always present in my life. And I, I also always had this sense of, um, you know, I, I was thinking about this before our conversation. I was thinking, do I, did I have a single moment of a rude awakening about the state of our planet? And I really didn't. I, I feel like I always knew that we were doing something really out of whack. Um, yeah. That we were really, I was aware that like outside of my community, it was like it was like I was from another planet and I was observing this species that was operating with so much um, suppression of their emotions and so much uh, dysfunction in communication um, that I didn't even understand the wider systemic issues, but I knew that something was really off. And um, of course, you know, well, maybe not of course, but in middle school, we had a uh, really in-depth education about being environmental stewards. We began um, a, a, a classroom garden where we grew our own fruit and vegetables. So I began to have some more ecological consciousness at that time. Um, but it wasn't until uh, I entered college where I really began to have a sense of like existential dread and uh, misery. Um, but it wasn't actually ecological, it was social. Um, it, was, it wasn't until I entered college where I really understood what the legacy of um, patriarchal white supremacist capitalist systems were. And it was really alarming. And I think a lot of people in uh, liberal arts colleges right now go through this period of time where um, the main word in their vernacular is problematic and like all they can say is like that's problematic that's problematic because we're going through this whole experience of like everything around me is totally messed up everything that I am participating in yes. uh, even the the structure of my education that is showing me these things is inherently um like really extractive and uh and there's so much gatekeeping uh where people of so many different identities don't have access to this information how do i make sense of this so i went through a pretty intense crisis of my own identity during that time um sure. uh, especially especially as a white person of um of you know not only racial privilege but um i also just to have the educational privileges that I have. I have uh, some cultural privilege from being able to travel when I was younger um, with my family. I, I have all of these different elements and, and I went through a strong period of, you know, intense white guilt, which is mm -hmm. something that a lot of people are, are uh, discovering. And that's like the first step and it really can't stop there. Uh, so then I had to kind of resource inside of myself, not just feeling shitty about who I am, but finding the gift in who I am and getting clear on how I can actually use everything that I am to serve um, the healing of, yeah. of all of the trauma and all of the wounds of this world. Um, and so that, that began a whole journey uh, that was reflected in my academic work and um, that I very much am continuing uh, all the time. And, you know, this, this level of self-reflection of how am I contributing to all of these cascading problems, which are totally related to one another, you know, social injustice is not separate from ecological injustice. They're all part of the same system of domination of, and extraction. And we need to learn how to live and embody what is the opposite of domination and extraction at every single level. We can't just silo issues and say, you know, um, you know, ocean acidification is more important than racism. That's absurd. They come from the same level of consciousness. And if we can address that, then everyone, I think, if everyone was able to heal their own trauma and their own wounds and realize that we all have this mutual shared responsibility, I think that everyone would show up in service in a way that is um, tremendously beneficial and could have the potential to heal this world. Um, whether or not that'll happen. Yeah, it's a bit, a bit more idealistic than I think yeah. I'm willing to go, but then I've had yeah. more years to become uh, sort of hardened or just a little bit, uh, not cynical, because I'm hardly that. 
but um, for me, ecology is so grounding that population pressure is so determinant that wherever population pressure exists, there will be social dysfunctions that are inescapable and unavoidable. And with seven and a half billion plus people um, using more resources than the natural systems can can provide simply because we have this dense concentrated energy that allows us to do that temporarily and exuding more waste than the systems can bear. Um, many of us, most of us, I think most humans um, feel some level of tension and stress and population pressure that um, I see as fundamental or foundational or undergirding so many of the social and uh, you know, social justice is grounded in a larger uh, where we have been out of right relationship to the future for, for hundreds, thousands of years. Intergenerational injustice mm -hmm. is what undergirds so much of social injustice. And I see uh, white supremacy as really grounded in a deeper human supremacy that we've had this, this uh, way of thinking and living in the world that's so out of right relationship to reality, whether you use secular or religious names for reality that we are now reaping the consequences. And I think that we are in the early stages of the ages of the, of the, the age of great reckoning that we are in the early stages of that. And um, uh, I, I, this is just my personal philosophy. So feel free to reject all this. Um, but I, I, no amount of sort of no, 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 you know, if only enough of us had a, an enlightenment experience or only if enough of us made these decisions or made these choices. And yet I think the core, the heart of what I'm hearing you saying is vital, which is that each of us is at a choice point in our lives at every moment. And we can choose the path of generosity, compassion, integrity, right relationship to reality, or we can choose the self-centered path, the path of domination, the path of control, the path of ultimately breakdown. At any rate, I've I, I did, didn't mean to get on my soapbox there, but, um, um, but, but say a little bit more about your own education uh, you, because you started my academic studies, but you didn't say a little bit about it. Say a little bit more about your academic studies and then what you do professionally now on how this serves this life vision of yours. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, my academic studies, I, I ended up writing my thesis on Buddhist women's activism which is very niche, uh, but was very formative in, in me structuring my relationship with the world. Um, because at the, at the time, uh, I, was, I was really focused on my own Buddhist practice and then really diving into um, Buddhism, both academically and with uh, my Tibetan Buddhist teacher, uh, whose name is Zira Kongchul Rinpoche. Um, and he's amazing, and my professors were amazing. And um, I spent one semester at Naropa studying Tibetan translation mm -hmm. because I thought I wanted to go into the, the classical translation route. I felt a deep responsibility to participate in the preservation of um, Tibetan wisdom texts and culture uh, as, as an ally in any way I could. Um, but while I was at Naropa, we, it happened to be the 40th year anniversary of the school. And um, they had the Radical Compassion Symposium that fall. And I... Um, enrolled in that as like a mini elective and Joanna Macy was actually one of the keynote speakers um, and uh, along with Vandana Shiva and the two of them as these amazing powerhouse grandmothers um, embodying the embodying the two religions that I was most formalized, formally, you know, engaged with, which was yes. Hinduism and Buddhism, uh, and then bringing forward this incredible clarity of articulating where we are as a species, what our greatest challenges are from their perspectives, what they're doing, and inviting everyone to participate in the web of life in a good way. Um, completely rocked my world and that that shaped the rest of my work. Um, so I, I ended up writing my thesis, as I said, about Buddhist women's activism. Um, it was called something like, uh, you know, Buddhist women uh, dissolving divisions, something like that. Um, and I was just really interested in how uh, significant Buddhist women in the past, the present, and also people working on behalf, explicitly working on behalf of the future, um, have, have dealt with some of these really intense questions of, um, of, of inequality and of suffering and of samsara and all of these things that, um, 
you know, the, the dukkha, the suffering, the unsatisfactoriness of reality, you know, that's something that has always been a truth. Um, and right now we're experiencing uh, deeper levels of, of basically just like avoidable dukkha, like, you know, old age, sickness and death. These are some of the foundational things that the Buddha talked about. But now we're dealing with the kinds of death, you know, factory farmed animals and, you know, just so much horrific, avoidable nonsense that our species has created. Like, how do we grapple with that? Um, so my thesis took me into a lot of different environments. Um, I went to Indonesia to a huge conference on Buddhist women. That was amazing. Um, that The theme of it was uh, was compassion and action um, and like compassion and social justice specifically, uh, which was amazing. And, um, and I also wrote a profile on three Buddhist women working on behalf of the future, which included Joanna Macy, um, Dekila Chungyalpa, who has done amazing work on bringing religious leaders into environmental um, action and, and teaching their communities about environmental um, mm -hmm. degradation. And then also this incredible uh, none in South Korea, um, Jiyul Sunim, who has, is really the reason that we're seeing um, the rights of nature being advocated in court systems so much now around the world. Uh, she really was the, as far as I know, the first person who began doing that. And she began, um, she would fast, she would do prostrations, she would do all these traditional uh, Buddhist monastic forms of nonviolent protest. But then she began uh, educating herself about legal systems and bringing corporations and governments to court um, representing the rights of a claw tooth salamander of like this tiny, tiny salamander, which was a keystone species. Um, and because of it's in the law system, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't um, counting on winning, but she knew that if, if um, evidence was entered into the legal system, it would be protected and it could not be erased and denied and fixed the way that corporations and governments so often do. And so she just started with that. And now we're seeing this whole global movement of um, the rights of nature uh, coming into effect in a lot of different places, which I think is uh, at least a heartening indication that humanity is catching on to something good. Yes. Well, I agree. Thomas Berry was one of my most significant male mentors. Joanna Macy, one of my most significant female mentors. And Thomas Berry wrote a lot in his final years about earth jurisprudence and the, the necessity of, of acknowledging the rights of other creatures, the rights to their habitats, um, and that they really need to be represented. He, he had a quote I used to use in my programs. He said, democracy, as it's currently formulated, is a conspiracy against the natural world. Because democracies give all rights and privileges to individuals and to corporations rather than honoring the rights of the rivers, the other species and whatever. He said, what we need is a biocracy mm -hmm. where humans represent the voices and the well-being of other species within the democratic process. Yeah. Sort of shifting from a human-centered understanding of democracy to a biocentric or life-centered understanding of democracy. The other thing I want to mention, uh, because you're roughly the same age as my youngest daughter, uh, Miriam, uh, Miriam Joy Dowd and her husband, Trevor Eller, they're also very much... Hindu and and uh, uh, probably travel in similar circles. He's a Kirtan musician as well. And one of the great joys of my life was about eight or nine years ago when my youngest daughter, Miriam, who was born in 1990, spent a week with Joanna. So to have my youngest child spend a week with my most significant female mentor was truly one of the great highlights of my life. Uh, so let me um, let me ask a question based on I mean one of the things that Joanna always kept bringing around coming back to is how the epic of evolution or the universe story the big picture told by science but interpreted in spiritually nourishing ways gives us a profound sense of interrelatedness and interconnection with all beings and that we are in a hard time and it's the knowledge of the bigger story that can carry us through. And I'm curious if that's been the case for you. Has, has this larger story of humanity within the body of life, mm -hmm. have you found that uh, story inspiring? And if so, uh, how so? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, so Joanna and I both have a similar kind of background in, in studying uh, Majamaka philosophy. Um, and I was studying Majamaka, which is the, the um, 
Tibetan Vajrayana philosophy of, of interdependence, essentially. Um, and I was studying that before I really fully encountered her work. Um, and so to encounter her work and how it applied to this, this uh, philosophy that really made a lot of sense to me um, was, was deeply heartening. And um, her writings, honestly, and her work have been uh, some of the things that have, have nourished me the most. Um, especially just the structure of the work that reconnects, yeah. um, you know, grounding myself in gratitude and then opening myself up to the pain of the world and then seeing with new eyes. And when you see with new eyes, you're always coming from a place of, um, I, I think when you go through those two things, you, you always land on interdependence. Like it's just not even a question. It's something that happens, I think, to everyone. Um, and I was never fully raised in, a world that that indoctrinated me into another way of looking at things, um, mm. and in that way, I'm I'm blessed. Um, but actually, in our in our garden here, we have a uh, we we have a recycled um, glass door, like you know those sliding glass doors that people have in Florida uh, that somebody was going to get rid of, and we we saved it from the landfill, and we had somebody um, do an etching in the glass that has the Stanley Kunitz quote, um, the universe is a continuous web, touch it at any point and the whole web quivers. And I've always felt that in my whole life, my whole childhood, whenever yes. I thought about, um, you know, I mean, like 9-11 was a huge, huge moment in, in my um, generation's life. And I think that a lot of the people that are my age, one of the reasons that we're not like totally surprised to find out that the world is crumbling and collapsing all around us is because we experienced that yeah. at a young age in, with yes. 9-11. And, and it, we, saw, we saw the shock and the trauma of that experience um, to our elders, to our parents, to our teachers. Um, and I think that we kind of like shifted our brains to being like, well, at least I cannot be surprised if this happens. Um, and, and like, you know, seeing that, like, that was a, I mean, that was a huge, you know, huge impact on the web of interdependence. It changed so many things on this planet, um, irrevocably. Um, but I think that, you know, massive, massive planetary shifts like that, um, that have implications with politics, with ecology, with uh, the economy, with our day-to-day -day lives, we can see if we, if you spend even a minute contemplating interdependence, you see that, that it's at play all around us. And that's really what karma is as well. Karma is just cause and effect within the web of interdependence. And um, it's really as, as simple and as infinitely complex as, as that. Yes, I agree. I love the, that way of languaging it. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of Americans, especially maybe just humans at this time, if we don't distinguish the difference between healthy cultures, sustainable cultures, life-giving cultures, ecologically sane cultures, um, as we were for 97, 98% of human history and distinguish those from human-centered cultures, uh, self-destructive cultures, cultures that rapidly go into overshoot and use more resources and exude more waste than the system can bear and the population pressure resulting from that. If those distinctions aren't met, then we can easily assume that humans have always been kind of like we are now, which is this dysfunctional, oppressive, you know, as you said, patriarchal, but also a domination approach to the living world rather than, rather than a humble relationship to primary reality the land belongs to, or we belong to the land, an arrogant domination, the, this belief that the land belongs to us. And so I, I my hunch is that, uh, and the little I've read about sustainable, in, surviving pockets of, of indigenous cultures that still live in a mutually enhancing relationship with the living world, with primary reality, um, the kinds of suffering that we take for granted, the kind of dukkha and suffering that we take for granted um, was not there in the same way in cultures that lived in an intimate rapport with the living world as a vow to be honored and respected and submitted to ultimately than a, uh, an it that we think we can dominate or control or simply use for our benefit. Mm -hmm. There's a shift in thinking that I found incredibly helpful that's coming to mind right now. Um, and it actually really became a big part of my of my life and my way of thinking about things uh, with my friendship with David McConville growing, um, which is this shift uh, from from domination thinking, which is uh, 
which is so part of our of our culture that we see ourselves we literally see ourselves as standing on top of the earth and so shifting into um, what David calls like spherical consciousness um, and seeing that we are within the earth and not on top of it um, even if we're standing on top of an arid desert we are still protected by um, microbes and you know so many layers of 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 our biosphere and it's, the magnetic field and the, the magnetic field like all of it um and so it's like just stepping into that perspective um as just like a thought experiment i find incredibly helpful in shifting every other element of of my thinking in relation to all of these things it's like that's one of those um that's one of the thought experiments that i think has cascading positive benefits um, on every other element of how we can relate to, to the world of just being like, we are, um, yeah, we are, we are in the earth. We are of the earth. Uh, recently I, I had a conversation with Ram Dass, um, and we were talking a little bit about this stuff and he, he, he did this just like wiggling his fingers and he just said fingers on the hand. And from his perspective, he's talking about, you know, fingers on the hand of, of God and, you know, unconditional love consciousness mm -hmm. that his guru Neem Karoli Baba embodied. But for me, my guru is the earth. And I got a lot of clarity, actually, the last time I was with Ram Dass. I was like, even though I was raised in this tradition, um, my guru is this earth, this planet. And she talks to me all the fucking time. <laughs> and every time I stop to listen, she's there and she's communicating to me. And um, all I have to do is follow the guidance of this higher order of consciousness that is literally asking us and giving so many of us instruction. And I mean, if you look at you know, like the prote protesters at Manawa Kea, like they, they aren't saying this is our land, this is our right. They're saying we're here to protect the mountain because the mountain is speaking to us and the mountain is saying, I don't consent to this any longer. There are enough uh, telescopes on this, on this mountain. It is sacred land, enough is enough. And the people are the, the mouthpieces for that higher order of consciousness, their elder, which is the mountain. And um, I think that whatever whatever becomes the next most engaged most creative species on this planet whether it's humanity or uh, a fungus or you know like there are a lot of options uh, we don't know and when it comes to deep time evolutionary thinking we don't know what it'll be but i i like to imagine and i and i pray and i hope that whatever it is is something that is aware that it is a living breathing part of a wider whole and that has the capacity to really deeply listen to everything that is unfolding around it and to the messages of that wider whole, which is so much more intelligent than we could ever claim to be. Yeah, well, amen, preach it, sister. I mean, I'm so with you. Um, one of the things that I think along those lines is that the only forms, okay, uh, I, I've got two cascading thoughts. <laughs> one, of them, one of them is a quote from Joanna Macy where she talks about that this shift, the shift from thinking of ourselves as separate creatures on earth that walk around on an earth to thinking of ourselves as a mode of being an expression of earth she said this shift is essential to our survival because it can serve in lieu of morality and because moralizing is so ineffective yeah she says sermons seldom hinder us from pursuing our self-interest i mean as a preacher i'm here to tell you i can <laughs> preach on blue in the face and people are going to do what's in their own perceived self-interest regardless of whatever i say yeah. so joanna says what we need is to be a little more enlightened about what our self-interest is yeah. for example it would never occur to me to say don't cut off your leg no really don't cut off your leg because your leg's a part of you and you know it joanna says so are the trees in the amazon basin there are external lungs and that's what we're, we're, what we're waking up to is that we are our world. And what we do to our world, we do to ourself. It's our larger body. It's our larger self. And I'm reminded of John Seed, who, who co-authored with Joanna, Thinking Like a Mountain. And he said that he's not John Seed protecting or speaking for the rainforest. He's the rainforest in the form of John Seed speaking on behalf of itself. Yeah. So that deep identity is just so vital. So I love the way and, you phrase that. And that's absolutely, that's, I mean, that's, that's, I think that that perspective is like the defining perspective in, of indigeneity. And, you know, we can talk about indigenous cultures um, on this continent, on Turtle Island and, um, and around the world. Uh, and, you know, if you look at 
uh, you know, in South Africa, they have this concept of Ubuntu, you know, I am because you are, because we are. Uh, there's this collective identity that that precludes violence um, if it's if it's fully lived. And, you know, we hear that with, you know, just every every opening invocation of any um, ceremony or event that has that has been opened by someone indigenous to this continent uh, always begins with an acknowledgement of our relations that are the streams and the rivers and the you know the winged ones the four leggeds all all of these species the invisible microbes even you know this is all of our family and i think one of the one of the biggest tasks that i incorporate into my work as someone of european heritage um, I really seek to reconnect with my own indigenous roots, with the roots of indigenous European awareness that were suppressed so long ago with the witch hunts, and even before that with, you know, Roman occupations on Germanic and French lands, um, and and trying to trying to relate to to my own ancestors and uh, and and operate from that place so that I'm not just um, you know furthering extraction culture by extracting uh, worldviews from other people but realizing that my own ancestors did have good relationship with the land and did know how to heal themselves and heal their communities and did have this kind of awareness even if it was such a long time ago that we don't have any proof. Um, that's that's something that's really important to my work and something that I encourage everyone that I work with. I, I bring them through a whole process of uh, re-indigenizing themselves. So I, I work with people and help them connect to place uh, to understand where they where they physically live, uh, what is what is happening in place now, what is what are the plants around you, what are the animals, what are the ecological um, disruptions that are happening because of human presence, what's going on right now, what was you know, who, who lived on this land before, you know, the people who looked like you arrived, you know, like question, meaningful questions like that. So that goes into deep space, deep ecology of where you are right now and, and bringing people into place, which is a huge part of regenerative practice. Um, but then I also bring people into deep time and into relating to, to their own ancestors. And, and also all ancestors of this planet are uh, the species that, that, came so long before us, like before many different levels of ecological uh, extinction events. They are all also our ancestors and the bones of our bodies are made out of the same minerals that formed so many different lifetimes, that life forms on this planet for such a long time. Um, and relating to all of those beings as our ancestors that we can harvest um, and receive wisdom from if we if we are willing to be courageous and open ourselves up to that. That's, I think, one of the most important um, practices for anyone to do, and and everyone is capable of doing it because everyone's existing at an intersection of time and space. Wow! 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 Uh, <laughs> well, I'm curious uh, as you think about this intersection of time and space, and as you ponder deep time and the species, our ancestors that we can learn from that have gone before us, even those that have gone extinct. How do you think about human history? Like, do you have, is there some part of you that thinks like, if only, like if we only had done this, or if we only hadn't taken that path, or, you know, Daniel Quinn talks about totalitarian agriculture and other people have placed sort of that. But I'm curious, how, do you think of that? Or do you have some sense of like, well, maybe it was inevitable for tool using symbolic speaking animals. Um, how do you how do you interpret the past with respect to that? I don't think that way any longer. Um, yeah, it was definitely a process for me of just being like, oh my god, humans! If only this, if only you didn't colonize everything, if only you didn't, you know, all of these different things. And um, I don't think that we're. I don't think that we're inherently on this trajectory at all. I, I mean, I think there are a, there are a lot of past civilizations that that didn't do what we're doing. But but if you look at a number of a number of major civilizations, um, you know, in Mesopotamia and in Egypt and in all of these places, they are now deserts. They were not deserts to begin with. And I think that we can learn a lot about the legacy of human civilization and desertification. Um, certainly. Um, but I guess, I guess I just don't find it very useful any longer to, to get, to go into those questions of if only, um, because here we are, we're here now. What can, what can I do now? Um, that's, that's really where, 
where I am uh, in, in terms of my own process. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's interesting to just even reflect on the fact that I used to think that way a lot. I used to, I used to look at so many different points in human history and, and kind of just want to like kick ourselves, you know, <laughs> you know, but, but it's, but it's not, um, I don't find that useful. And, uh, and I'm really, I'm really devoted these days to effective uses of my, of my energy and of my, especially my mental energy um, yes. because we can think ourselves into holes from, you know, of despair from here until literally the end of the world. Uh, but that's not going to necessarily bring more meaning to the life that exists on this planet right now. And that's, that's what I'm really interested in doing is uh, bringing a deeper sense of meaning um, and, and connection and love and, uh, just different different orders of consciousness and deep listening to to humanity in whatever way we can with whatever time we have to do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, amen. Well, I'm curious how much what what practices have you found useful or helpful? Um, what habits or spiritual practices uh, have you found particularly nourishing with regards to staying present to the reality of things, but ultimately moving through whatever feelings are there that. Are that can be disempowering if we wallow in those yeah. to places of um, inspired local action or, you know, meaningful engagement. How, what, what practices have been particularly helpful for you? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's often surprises people to hear that I don't have like a dedicated sitting meditation practice. Um, I'm not, I'm not very regimented in the way that I live my life. Um, but my main, my main spiritual practice is making sure that I get my feet and my hands in the earth every day. And um, even if only for the, you know, microbiome uh, mental health benefits of uh, exposing myself to diverse uh, microbes, uh, but truly to, to really deeply connect with the earth every day in whatever way I can, even if it's just while I'm drinking my tea or my coffee in the morning, um, there are, there's, a, there's an orchid bee that comes and visits me every morning when I sit outside with my, with my morning drink uh, that just comes and hovers right in front of my face and I'm communing with it. And um, I'm in relationship with, with that orchid bee, uh, which is just like these beautiful jewel toned, um, you know, peacock kind of colors. It's so beautiful. And, and um, there are a lot of days when I don't do that, honestly. I mean, like, I, I'm really a not, not a regimented person, but I notice the change in, in my disposition in my mental health, in my uh, presence with the world around me and how much I can get stuck into um, really unhealthy thought patterns when I'm not doing that. And then mm -hmm. I also, um, my background, as I said, uh, is with, uh, with Neem Karoli Baba, the Ramdas community, um, which is a bhakti community. And so love and devotion and beauty are really, really important elements of our spiritual practice. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I wake up every morning with um, a playlist of, spiritual music playing uh, that that brings me into just the first thing that that I think about when I wake up is is the the divine and sacred nature of everything around me and it kind of transitions from a from a meditative state that brings me out of my dream time into my body into uh, music that I can dance to and so I, I dance alone in my room um, as soon as I wake up and I just kind of come to this body because uh, I am, I'm a very intellectual person. I can be very cerebral. Um, I can very much get stuck in my own mind and, and in my sense of despair and, um, and pain. And when I find, I find that when I start my days, like I did today, uh, moving my body, connecting with the earth, um, you know, being consciously choosing not to just be here in my head, but to be in my entire body, uh, I feel like that's a radical act of transforming humanity because I feel like so much of humanity is like, we're just in our minds. We're, we're just in our, you know, oh, how can we solve this problem um, by like reducing it to its smallest parts? You know, we, we have this massive imbalance uh, where, we, where we overwhelmingly live here um, and not in, in the rest of who we are, which is the entire body of the planet. So I, that's, a, that's a huge ecological practice of mine is, is coming into my body. And I have a lot of chronic pain. I know a lot of people in my generation also have a lot of chronic pain, a lot of health issues. I have um, fibromyalgia and Lyme disease and anybody listening who wants to send me uh, recommendations of how to, how to heal these things, please don't. I have a really good team of healers uh, 
please don't give people unsolicited <laughs> medical advice. But uh, a lot of people in my generation have have issues like this in our in our bodies, which makes it really hard for us to know how we can actually show up for um, the world when when our bodies are challenged and so that makes it even hard for us to make a living uh, in an economy which is basically impossible for people in my generation to have savings or any kind of cushion anyway much yeah. less pay bills much less graduate from school without being in a mountain of debt yes. uh, and then on top of that we have these physical issues and on top of that we have existential dread uh, <laughs> it's like really an unfortunate situation i hope all of the people listening to your podcast uh, to or on YouTube um, who maybe are not in my generation, just like, please have some compassion for the millennials in your life because we're in a really weird setup and we, um, there's not a lot that makes us feel like we can have a meaningful life often. And that's something I encounter in my work a lot um, is people just not feeling like they, like life is worth living. And, um, what I've found from studying what's going on on the earth right now is that if you really study life, life is definitely worth living. Um, but you have to be living as if you are alive, as if you are a living organism, as if you are a part of a wider ecosystem uh, that is absolutely interdependent. And as soon as you make that shift, you start to experience you start to have mystical experiences all the time. And uh, you realize that you're never alone and that um, you know, you are, we are here on this planet at this time for some, for some reason, um, it might not have, I, like, there's different ways of looking at that. And I don't want to get too much into my own cosmology, because it's kind of irrelevant. It's my own thing. And people can reach out to me if they want to know. But, but I just, I look at all of these species here. And I'm like, yeah, we all are here for each other, if we choose to be. And when we choose to be, our lives are much more meaningful. You know, the permaculturalists that I know are the happiest people that I know. And if if you're unhappy in the world, if you feel despair, it's very understandable. It's a very human thing to be feeling right now. It means that you're paying attention. Allow yourself to feel it. Um, really allow yourself to feel it. I mean, I, I create I create a lot of rituals um, for people to feel their feelings. I recently posted it on Instagram, like just a really simple formula for a heartbreak ritual that allows you to ground yourself in your body, uh, allows yourself to actually feel everything that you're feeling and then process it, journal it, uh, bring what was in your unconscious to your consciousness, put it on the page, you know, burn it, do some kind of elemental release of it, and then go back to nurturing and nourishing and caring for and cleansing your body. And if you can kind of have a ritual, which is just a process that has an intention that has a beginning, a middle and an end, if you can do something that has a beginning in the middle and an end to process your grief and your despair, you can get to the other side of it. Uh, and on the other side of it is always seeing with new eyes if you're actually honoring what's coming up for you. And when you when you fully do that, then you can listen more clearly. You can listen to the the information of the systems interacting all around you, and um, and you can be more perceptive to what what is yours to do uniquely. And for some people, it's to step into a role as a healer. For some people, it's to step into a role as you know, a permaculturalist. For some people, it's, um, you know, commemorating, you know, beautiful music that is just a beautiful part of being human and like bringing it to the world. One of one of my clients that I work with um, recently, I had her uh, just go out into nature and just sing. You know, she lives in an area of Puerto Rico that has lots of lots of nat nature trails that she hardly encounters anyone when she goes there with her dog and she has like a lot of vocal suppression. And so I was just like, yeah, you know, find songs that feel sacred to you. They don't have to be religious, but find songs that feel sacred to you that you can sing a cappella and just go out in nature and sing. And like that is a service to the planet. Because yes. the planet is, I believe the planet is listening. And if we look, there's, you know, studies that show that like trees hear us and they respond to us. And, um, and then to add, once you've, once you've sung, once you've uh, expressed yourself to the world around you with joy and peace and love for yourself and all life, then you can get really quiet and listen to what the response is. And there's always, there's always a response. There's always wisdom. 
that's there for people who are willing to go into the forest and listen deeply. It, it's like, there's a formula and humans have been doing it for a really long time. So we need to, we need to get with that. Amen. Amen. Wow. <sighs> okay. Last question. This has just really been rich. I got to tell you, uh, having to do with remaining opportunities. So I'm curious, what is your take on what's beyond our control and where we can still make a difference individually and collectively? I know that this isn't what you mean by it, but I, I want to kind of start by saying that I don't see myself as the arbiter of, of, of human destiny. Um, and I guess I, it's important for me to say that because a really key element of, of my own worldview is recognizing continuously that, um, that I'm not determining the future that all of us are determining the future, that we are co-creating whatever future happens. Uh, and we all have, uh, we all have a say to some degree. And um, even if it's very subtle, even if you're incredibly disempowered, um, I think that we all have a say in, in the future that is emerging on this planet. Um, because there is a future, whether or not humans have, have a place on this future, I think it's really important to remember that there is a future uh, in this universe, in this galaxy, in this solar system, and on this planet um, that is beyond our comprehension. My experience of processing is like, is allow, is like being a confessional, you know, being a space where someone can really really reckon with their life yes. and and try to clean up as much of it as possible and learn to live well even if it's just in your last couple of breaths to learn with like self-forgiveness to come into self-love to come into love of of all of existence even if it's only in those last moments and if that's what humanity is here to do then like i'm down for that too like i i don't get lost in hopelessness because i see the beauty and the ecological function and the spiritual function of dying really well and yes. if if only that that's if only that's the only reason that i'm here on this planet is to help us figure out how to die well um that's worthwhile to me and that's that gives my life a sense of meaning